Hello, everybody, and welcome to the monthly Open Mainframe Project webinar. Today, we will be talking about with the COBOL programming about the COBOL programming course, and I've got the team here. Um, so, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to put them in the chat or the Q and A, and we will answer them. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to the team. Guys, go ahead and introduce yourself. Thank you so much, Chris, for putting this together and giving us this opportunity to share about the COBOL programming course. My name is Sudarshna Srinivasan. I work for IBM as a program manager for our IBM Z influencer team. So what that means is working on all fun activities and engagements around uh, developer ecosystem and also our client skills engagement. Mike, do you want to go next? Uh, thanks, Sudarshna. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Michael Bauer. I'm a product owner here at Broadcom. I work primarily on our Brightside solution. Um, in the open source community, I contribute to both the Zoe and COBOL programming course projects underneath the Open Mainframe Project organization. Um, over to you, Paul. Yeah, I'm Paul Newton. I'm a consulting IT specialist with IBM. Been with IBM for about 20 years and was in industry for 20 years before I joined IBM. I helped get the um, the, the COBOL programming course started, and then others have taken over. So that's me. All right, so um, Mike, do you wanna go on to the next slide and we'll talk about sort of the journey and the, the genesis of this COBOL programming course that we're gonna talk about. Um, this is a great question. Why develop a COBOL programming course? Um, when this all got started, uh, it was all about, you know, let's let's bring together a new COBOL course. And this is well before 2020 happened. Let's work on a COBOL course that also brings in some of the modern tooling and um, weaves in, you know, things like VS Code. And we'll talk about all that more in detail later. But let me just talk about um, take a moment here, step back and talk about skill shortage. And we talk about skill shortage in, co in COBOL and in, you know, the IBM Z space in general. And look at, look at here, look at what this chart says. There has always been skill shortage in manufacturing. Cybersecurity is seeing, um, you know, really high skill shortage at the current moment. There's lots of opportunities that are um, going unfilled, right? So it is not something unique to um, the mainframe space or to enterprise computing, as we would call it, or um, anything specific to COBOL that you know we need to make make such a big deal of it. But nonetheless, 2020 has been that year for COBOL, right? Um, so back to my story about how we got started to on all this uh, on this journey. Uh, fall of 2019, we wanted to be able to bring together a COBOL course that resonates with that next generation of COBOLers so that we could bring that next generation of talent into this space. Um, Mike, the next chart. And as we were working on it, and you heard Paul say that he's part of the team that uh, worked on building that COBOL course, and we were well on our way working on getting the content. It, it was a collaborative project and boom, come March, I think, I think it was March sometime um, that uh, the New Jersey governor said there was, you know, lack of cobalt experience um, in, in the workforce. So, and that was, that was it. That was the biggest ever thing that happened. And then so many different um, articles and, uh, you know, news around COBOL, the lack of skills in COBOL space. Um, and, you know, why is COBOL even around? So many questions around COBOL keep coming up. Um, when, when the question of why is COBOL still around or what is COBOL still doing, uh, one comment that Professor Tuck from ARC made comes to mind, and it is a powerful statement. A programming language is not a fashion statement, right? It, you do, you use it because it does the job and it does it really well. And that is COBOL. COBOL does what it does, which is business processing, um, business logic processing, simply, beautifully, and powerfully. So that is why it is here. It has been here. And I want to say it will be here driving the world's economy. And I know Paul is nodding his head, even though he's off camera. Um, next slide, Mike. So 
we got to working on this COBOL course as a collaborative effort, as I mentioned, with the, with the American River College, a few clients and IBM all coming together, bringing, our, bringing their SMEs and having a dedicated month long workshop, uh, workshop that you know, focused on what, what would this next generation COBOL course look like? Um, and when we were busy working on it, the, the news about COBOL and everybody wanting to learn COBOL was the next best thing. So we had to quickly land this course for the large community of learners. And big, big, big shout out and thanks to John Murdick and the Open Mainframe Project that we were able to land this course on April 14th as an Open Mainframe Project, um, ready and available for the whole large open source community to not just learn COBOL, but also contribute to the content. And I know Mike is gonna talk a lot about that. Um, so I think I will pause here with, um, with this amazing picture. There you see Paul Newton and the rest of our team that was part of the uh, creation of this COBOL course that you see and have available on Open Mainframe Project. Any questions or uh, not yet, I don't see, but Mike, do you wanna? Sure, Sudarshna, I can uh, pick it up from there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the next topic I wanna discuss is uh, what would you learn uh, by going through the course content? And again, I feel encouraged to engage in the chat. I'm sure Paul and Sudarshna will stop me if there are, are questions along the way. So let's get started. <clears throat> um, the course is currently broken down into two different books. The first one is focused on getting started. In part one of that course, we introduce COBOL, uh, specifically with reference to its use in these enterprise systems. Uh, we cover what COBOL is, how COBOL is being used today, and why you should care about it. We also introduce the tooling that is leveraged throughout the course. We need various tools uh, to interact with the mainframe, interact with COBOL, so we can offer hands-on learning, um, hands learning opportunities. We cover the installation, configuration, and usage of Visual Studio Code. Zoe Explore, IBM Z Open Editor, Broadcom Code for Z, Zoe CLI, and CLI plugins. And I'll briefly touch on what each of those components are and why they are important to this course. So Visual Studio Code is a lightweight, fast, and free text editor developed by Microsoft. I'll also note that it is built from their open source repository so that the broader community uh, can help develop that product. Uh, Visual Studio Code has been well received by the broader community. Um, for example, based on a Stack Overflow developer survey I read in uh, 2016, VS Code only ranked 13th among popular text editors and IDEs with about 7% of respondents using it, but it had just hit the market uh, not too far before that. In 2018, it moved to the top spot as the most used text editor or IDE with about 35% of the respondents using it. And in 2019, the survey showed over 50% of the respondents using it. Uh, it felt like a good choice to use in this project uh, because it is uh, widely adopted by the development community and it is also uh, freely accessible for folks to use, which was uh, important in the development of this course. Um, the Zoe Explore is an open source Visual Studio Code extension. So at its core VS Code, it's a lightweight text editor, but it can be uh, expanded um, to meet the needs uh, of various developers through these extensions. Um, Zoe Explore streamlines interaction with mainframe data sets, USS files, and jobs. It is also one of the most popular components of Zoe, exceeding 24,000 unique installations. But a lot of those installations are probably for um, going through this course as well. So it's, um, it's synergistic, Zoe, as well as this uh, COBOL programming course. Now, in addition to Zoe Explore, a number of other extensions for mainframe interaction have emerged on the VS Code marketplace. One such extension included in this course 
is IBM's Z Open Editor. This extension offers a free modern editing experience for IBM Z enterprise languages. Primarily in this course, it is an extension that provides language support for COBOL. Broadcom's Code for Z is a mainframe extension package for Visual Studio Code. The Code for Z package contains extensions which provide language support for COBOL and high-level assembler, a debugger for COBOL programs, as well as tools which enable developers to access mainframe data sets and CA Endeavor code repositories using the VS Code interface. The primary extension leverage from this package in this course is the free and open source COBOL language support extension. It offers similar language support for COBOL and this gives learners a choice in the tooling uh, for this course. And all of this is, is freely available. Whether you choose to use the Z Open Editor or the Code for Z package, uh, you will be able to learn COBOL through, through this course. Next is the Zoe CLI and Zoe CLI plugins. CLI stands for Command Line Interface. Command Line Interfaces are very useful for developing automation. You can quickly explore the functionality of a CLI interactively and then easily abstract commands into more complex and useful scripts. Really, I view each command as a building block upon which you can develop more complex and specific automation to meet your needs. The key with the CLI is that the Zoe CLI is a bridge tool between the distributed systems and the mainframe. I'll also note that the Zoe CLI is extensible through plugins, just like VS Code is extensible through extensions, and that has been well adopted. There are currently 25 conformant Zoe CLI plugins, and this enables access to a wide variety of mainframe subsystems and products. As a bridge tool, it enables the use of a plethora of open source tools for the mainframe. For example, pick your favorite language or open source tool, and you can now leverage it for mainframe development. Just in this case, we're picking maybe perhaps Visual Studio Code as one of our favorite distributed uh, text editors, and now we're leveraging it for uh, mainframe development. But it goes beyond that. For example, want to develop automation in Python? Do you want to write tests in Node? Do you want to run Jenkins pipelines for continuous integration? Maybe use open source testing frameworks like Mocha or Facebook's Jest, or you want to leverage code quality tools like SonarCube. All of that is made possible with the CLI acting as a bridge tool, and you get some experience, hands-on experience with the Zoe CLI as part of this course. In this course, and for mainframe COBOL apps, the Zoe CLI can be leveraged to automate the build, deployment, and testing processes, and that is exactly how it's leveraged um, within this course. So uh, once we have our tooling set up from part one, we dive into learning about COBOL in part two. Throughout the course, we leverage our tooling to complete hands-on lab exercises. In the first chapter of part two, we introduce the basics of COBOL syntax. For example, we discuss and answer the, these questions. What are the coding rules and reference format? What is the structure of COBOL? What are COBOL reserved words? What is a COBOL statement? What is the meaning of a scope terminator? What is a COBOL sentence, paragraph, and section? In the chapter's labs, you will learn how to run a simple COBOL Hello World program in VS Code, a very simple getting started exercise, and then automate the job submission to compile link and run the program using the Zoe CLI. In the data division chapter, COBOL variables and program processing is covered. It focuses on variables, moving literals into variables, and then writing the variable content using the COBOL display statement. In the file handling chapter, we introduce learners to reading records from files, uh, placing that content into variables, uh, moving variables to output variables, and writing those to a different file. In the program structure chapter, we highlight key techniques within the COBOL language that allow you to write well-structured programs. The file output chapter focuses on designing a structured layout that is easy, easy to read and understand. This involves things like column headings and variable alignment, numeric format, currency format, 
uh, things of that nature. The chapters on conditional and arithmetic expressions, uh, it's fairly self-explanatory, but within those sections, they cover several topics through explanations, examples, and I wanna highlight hands-on exercises. Each one of these uh, chapters in part two, they all end with a lab uh, where you will um, have a hands-on opportunity to test your learning. And then the course continues with a chapter covering data types and data representation in COBOL and concludes with discussing uh, intrinsic and built-in functions. And over time, um, as the COBOL uh, language has a, evolved and new versions have been released, we have seen uh, more new and interesting intrinsic functions. This is actually one of my uh, personal favorite chapters of the lab. So uh, <laughs> it's a little treat at, at the end to look, to look forward to. Um, and again, just to highlight, every, every chapter in part two ends with a, a hands-on lab to, to test your knowledge and really build your skill set. That covers the first book. Um, in our second book, uh, which was recently released, we cover some advanced topics and offer some additional hands-on challenges. Um, while I did mention that data sets and data representation in COBOL uh, was discussed in the introductory course, the opening chapter of course two seeks to expand upon that. It, it discusses binary and hexadecimal numbering systems, as well as the specific uh, numeric representations in COBOL. The second chapter covers COBOL application programming interfaces. The chapter uh, mostly focuses on uh, COBOL APIs to communicate with ZOS middleware, um, DB2, CICS, MQ, and IMS. And then the course concludes with a series of COBOL challenges. And I've provided some screenshots of these challenges um, on the right. Um, in the debugging challenge, uh, you must correct an issue introduced in the code. In the COVID-19 reports challenge, you are tasked to create a COVID-19 summary report of all the countries around the world using information from the COVID-19 uh, API website. Essentially, this involves extracting content from the website, uploading a CSV file to the mainframe, and developing a COBOL program that reads this file and reformats it to display in a desired format. Then we have the unemployment claims challenge in which you are given a set of data for unemployment claims and you must create a new database for this set of data and combine that data based on a record ID field, provide a way for other COBOL programs and other applications to access this newly created database and develop a report specifying all the information available in that database. And then finally, uh, we have one of my one of my favorite challenges, which is the Hacker News Ranking Challenge. So the Hacker News Ranking uh, website, it hosts a, li uh, a list of posts uh, that can be upvoted or downvoted. And ranking is influenced by these votes as well as time. Uh, so older stories are ranked lower. Uh, so it's like you wanna be on the front page of the website is the goal. You need a lot of upvotes and you need to be relatively new to make front page news. So in this exercise, you develop a COBOL program that reads again, a CSV file. In this case, it only retrieves the posts that are related to mainframe or COBOL. Then it calculates the ranking score for particular stories and writes them to an output data set. Then DF sort is leveraged to sort the output based on the ranking score. And I wanted to note that this particular challenge was contributed by GitHub user Raven300. And Raven has also contributed additional content to various sections of the course. Uh, we thank her very much for, for her contributions as well. Um, I'll cover how each of you could get involved uh, if you would like um, in a few slides. Um, so next, I just want to show, this is, the, this is our project on OMP's website. And again, our primary goal, our primary objective with this course is to offer introductory uh, educational COBOL material with modern tooling that is accessible uh, to the community. Okay, so now that I've covered the uh, course content at a high level and the intent of the course, I'd like to discuss our journey. And Sudarshan, I covered some of this, but 
I, I want to give a little bit more detail. Um, so the, the course launched in mid-April. This was the official launch, as Shudarshana mentioned. Uh, the initial team who, who made the initial contribution was working on this uh, in March, preparing for the initial release. But uh, the launch happened in mid-April. And immediately after this, uh, we received many positive uh, reactions. Here's just one reaction uh, we saw on our uh, GitHub page from uh, Negavon13. He mentioned it's not an issue he was reporting, but uh, he was able to run his first ever COBOL program and was very excited um, moving forward in the, in the course. We received very similar um, reactions on GitHub and uh, our Slack communication channel, which I'll uh, highlight shortly. After the initial contribution, given the state of the world and um, the need for uh, COBOL developers and support, as well as the publicity around uh, the governor of New Jersey's comments regarding COBOL, uh, the course sort of went uh, viral and it quickly became the open mainframe projects most watched, starred, and forked repository. You can see today it has 205 watchers, over 1,800 stars, and many folks have uh, forked the repository. Um, folks may fork the repository just so that basically means they have a copy of it and they can improve upon it and um, optionally contribute back their, their, um, their edits. And we would encourage you to do so uh, later. Um, I, I'll show how to get involved more um, later in the presentation. Um, so I already covered the content in our released courses, uh, which are shown here, course one and two. I also wanted to note that there is some content focused specifically on testing in course three, uh, but that has not yet been released. Although uh, contributions would, would be welcome to that, uh, to that book to bring it to uh, release, um, release quality. And then on the right, we have our current technical steering committee members. Uh, we have Paul, Jelly, Martin, Zabura, uh, Sadarshna, John, and myself. And if you would like to uh, begin contributing, uh, you could possibly also become uh, a member of the TSC uh, later on. Okay, so next I wanna cover how you can get involved. Um, so the first part uh, of getting involved is just consuming the content. Um, and so in order to consume the content from the GitHub repository itself, you would just click on the releases tab and that would give you access to the most recent uh, release of the course. And then you can see the two books here on the right, one getting started, one advanced topics, and then you can just open those PDFs um, and sort of begin your journey. I also want to note while I have the uh, picture of the repository up here is if you run into any issues, uh, you can just click this issues button and report that and we'll, we'll try to help you the best we can. And if you would like to contribute to the course, you can just click this uh, fork button in the upper right where we see we have 360 of those. Um, make any changes um, and then what you would do is uh, GitHub would, it also helps you with this is open a PR back into our course to contribute your, your work. Um, if you have any trouble using GitHub or um, but you want to still contribute content, just feel free to reach out to me either on Slack or on, on GitHub and, and I can help you with that. Okay, so also how to consume the content, it's important to know where to get help. Um, so you can report issues on GitHub, but you can also reach out to our Slack channel. I recommend our Slack channel because many folks are involved there. I think there's less folks really watching the repository than communicating on Slack. On our COBOL programming course channel, you can see at the bottom of the screen, has over 2,000 members. And I'll note that um, the community does a great job helping others in the community. So it's not necessarily uh, us TSC members driving all the discussions or answering all the questions on there, but the community has been sort of helping others get started um, once they become um, more knowledgeable of the, of the course content. Also, you might be wondering, well, how do I access, how do I um, do the hands-on labs? You may not have a mainframe. 
Um, IBM has provided a free environment for completing this lab. If you did have a mainframe though, you could up all the code um, that's used for the um, for the labs is available in the GitHub repository. So you could upload those to a mainframe you have access to. Um, you might need to do a little bit of work on the environment, but then you could go through the course. Um, but uh, again, IBM has provided this free environment. So you can just click this, fill out the details on the form, and then uh, it'll give you the details on, on how to access uh, that mainframe environment through uh, VS Code and, and the tools I outlined earlier. And Paul on the line, he's really the lead in uh, maintaining this environment. So big shout out to, to Paul for providing that and really helping learners uh, get started. Okay, then I just wanted to mention some downstream projects. And all of these downstream projects I'm going to show, uh, they were created by Jeff Bisty. And Jeff uh, recently attended one of our TSC meetings and did an excellent job presenting an overview of the content in some of these courses. Um, so I would encourage you to check that out. Um, to see where to check that out, let me just go to the previous slide really quick. There's TSC meeting um, folder on, on the repository. You see it's the fourth folder down. If you click into there, you'll see uh, a recent meeting, a recent recording uh, link where Jeff presented this information. So definitely uh, check that out if you have some time. Um, and then the downstream content's available on IBM's digital learning platform, as well as uh, Coursera, Pluralsight, and uh, of course, YouTube. Um, so you just go to the YouTube link and start watching, watching the course. Um, and then that should help you get started. Um, with that, I think I'll turn it over to uh, Sadarshna to wrap up with some additional resources if there, there aren't any questions. Yeah, um, before, before I continue on, there's a question and I think um, Paul, if you could maybe talk to it. Um, while talking about the actual content, and um, I think that's the slide where you talk part one and part two, Mike, if you're able to go back to that slide. Um, as an SME who is part of building that course, I think this would be a good question for you to take, Paul. Any programming language, there's a lot, right? So the question is, you know, how did, how does, how did the SMEs and the team come up with what, what you would cover and, you know, distill it down to the list that we have here? for COBOL. Yeah, I can go ahead and begin to talk about that. Uh, it, it turns out that it wasn't too difficult to come up with it because there's a lot of technical documentation. And I will let you know what I did is I just went to the IBM manual, the COBOL programmer's guide and saw how that was organized. And then what I did is I said, well, I would like to do a couple little twists to that but I went directly to the professional manuals and used the technical writers um, organization and tried to follow that with a couple minor tweaks. The other thing I felt was extremely important because I've, I've been able to program in COBOL for decades. It's, I find it to be an extremely easy language. And one thing that, that intrigued me once I started looking at COBOL again uh, after many years of not looking at it, was the intrinsic functions. And I believe it was Mike that said that's the, uh, the chapter he liked. And the intrinsic functions are something that has been built up over time, making um, programming much, much easier in COBOL because what I used to have to write in logic, there's now functions for. And uh, it makes it much easier. So I knew that would be very important. And also, the other thing um, I probably built into it is simplicity. I want people to understand that this really is simple. So I would really focus on simplicity. And so that's how I kind of came up with it. The other question that was out there was an excellent one. They said, are you following the COBOL 85 standard or the COBOL 20, uh, 2000 standard? And I will let you know where um, the COBOL compiled team headed up by Tom Ross definitely uh, follows the latest standard. And there were, there were very, very few things that the standard has in it that's not in the IBM Z Enterprise COBOL. And 
Tom actually discussed that a little bit and a professor that was a very good professor that teaches COBOL mentioned during one of his lectures that let me show you how you can, you can um, have that standard function applied. And he showed how easy it was to do that standard without it being built into the compiler. And um, so when it comes to the standard, I would recommend looking at the COBOL Fridays and um, especially review the two from Tom Ross and Tom's known as Captain COBOL. So hopefully it answers the two questions and I'll stop right there. Excellent. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for that. Um, so yeah, in terms of additional resources, thank you, Mike. That was, uh, that was an amazing overview of everything that, um, you know, we've worked on in putting together um, on the GitHub repository here. Uh, a big shout out actually to Mike here on the call, because he is our, he's our GitHub hero and managing <laughs> and doing everything we can to make sure our learners have a really smooth and um, you know wonderful experience coming and learning COBOL on open mainframe projects. So yay, thank you, Mike. And, um, and I, I wanted to second that Sadarshna because <laughs> after we started putting the original content together, we were kind of in over our head when it came to GitHub and Mike came to the rescue. So exactly. it was really important. So <laughs> thank you, Mike. Oh, th thank you. <laughs> Absolutely, yep, he's, he's the superhero. Um, yeah, um, so the next next slide, Mike. So um, all, you know, with all the buzz that was happening around COBOL, we really wanted to make sure we had a, a one-stop shop, if you will, a landing page for all things COBOL. So just as we landed the COBOL programming course on Open Mainframe Project, at the same time, um, within IBM, we worked with the IBM developer team and created this um, COBOL landing page. So this is another huge resource. And again, this is pointed to from the resources section of the um, GitHub resource, uh, GitHub repository as well. The get started with COBOL here on this page actually will take you right back to the open mainframe project course. That's what we would like to drive people to to be able to learn COBOL and gives you the opportunity to actually get access to uh, a mainframe and do all of the labs. So it is a great learning opportunity. Um, and then on the right, we've got this video pinned, which is the introduction to COBOL programming language by Jeff. Um, when all of this buzz started, what basically Jeff wanted to do is write his first COBOL program and talk about what that journey was like for him. It's a really, really interesting video. Um, it is got, it's got way over 50,000 views or something like that. And this is in the first four weeks or so of his um, launching that video. So it's a, it's a viral video for sure. Um, Paul touched upon COBOL Friday. So that was another, um, again, um, a, a project that Paul and I worked on bringing, you know, SMEs, not just from within IBM, but from industry, from academia, and, you know, come talk about the various aspects of COBOL. Mike talked about all the various topics that are covered in part two in that initial getting started book. So that was sort of our um, thought process when we put the COBOL Fridays series together. We wanted to start with additional content, if you will, to bring SMEs to talk about the various topics that are covered in the course as a starting point. And then we, you know, dug a little deeper into um, all the middleware and you know the interactions that we get, we often talk about when it's COBOL, it has to talk to PIX and DB2 and IMS. So we brought in experts from all of these areas to talk about what that interaction looks like and how easy it is from a COBOL point of view, right? From a programming point of view. And then um, we then dug deeper into application modernization what that means in the COBOL space. We had a, a client, Dev, come and talk about how they have really taken application modernization to heart and it is, it is front and center for them. And um, Armin did an amazing job making it sound really easy and simple. So it's, it's a, a model for sure for other clients to, you know, to look, at, look at as well. Um, we recently wrapped up the COBOL Friday session earlier in December 
with um, students and academia coming together and really talking about what that next generation of COBOLers is going to look like. Where are those learning resources? How is academia helping out with COBOL as well? Um, and it was interesting to hear from a few students and uh, you know, see what their thought process is and how they are looking forward to actually learning COBOL and being in this space. So like Paul said, do check out the COBOL Friday series. I will drop a link to it again in our chat in just a moment. Um, so this is a this is another huge resource is basically what I'm driving to. So hope you um, catch this URL developer.ibm.com slash technology slash COBOL. Um, next slide, Mike. Okay, yeah, so here's here is um, the Open Mainframe project, the, the website that um, Mike shared, um, the, the GitHub repository, uh, where our releases are, and um, the Slack channel. So I think these are all resources that Mike definitely talked about in great detail. Yeah, just a note to add, just uh, if you're interested in capturing just one link, um, I'd recommend capturing that Slack channel link. And then uh, if you have any additional questions, we can we can follow up from there as well. So. Absolutely. Great point, Mike. So yeah, I think that's, that's really what we wanted to share with everyone here today. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm just going to wait, see if there's any other questions. And in the meantime, um, drop that link here in chat for the COBOL Fridays. And while we're waiting for questions, there's something that uh, occurred to me about a year ago when people would talk about the age of COBOL. Well, the age of other languages is, is a testimony to its, um, its strength and its flexibility. And I always, I came up with a phrase that I really believe is true. If COBOL didn't exist and business got together to create a language for business, they would probably invent COBOL all over again. And uh, because it does a fantastic job for what it's meant to do, especially in the financial world. And so I'll just leave people with that comment or that opinion of mine. So Paul, um, if you could share, you know, um, as an SME, what would you say is something really unique about COBOL? And Mike, please do chime in as well when Paul is done. Um, about COBOL and why would why would you um, how would you encourage you know students to look at COBOL? Well, there's several reasons. Is that um, many large large enterprises and they're very critical to the world economy have decades and decades of business logic in COBOL, and it does a fantastic job. And just knowing how to read it, you can go into an organization and you can read decades of logic of people that have come and gone from the business that built the business up. And uh, so it is the language of big business. And the other thing that it does extremely well, it's, it's got an internal optimizer. It's very, very fast. There have been situations I've been involved in where people tried to rewrite extremely important functions that are used in the worldwide economy, and they wanted to do it in Java. And they said their goal was to make it as fast as COBOL. And I would just say, good luck. And because it's, it's why do it in Java when COBOL is doing such a wonderful job. The other thing that I would say about it is the math, math, the financial mathematics are different than other types of mathematics. And nothing does the financial mathematics better than the IBM Z Enterprise COBOL. And Tom Ross actually brings that up and goes into detail about it along with a, um, a very good professor Dr. David Woolbright, who discusses that also, and they discuss it in detail. And so that's the that's the comments I would make about it. Yeah, I think from from my perspective, that's uh, probably similar to similar to Paul's. But you know, um, I come from a distributed background, so I'm very familiar with uh, with languages like Python and JavaScript and, and TypeScript and Using using tools like Visual Studio Code and CLIs and and um, CI/CD tools like Jenkins, and I'd like to be able to leverage those tools when I when I work on mainframe. And that's that's important uh, for me uh, as I'm involved with Zoe, and I like that aspect of it. 
but if you're talking about what you're actually working on, not necessarily the tools you're working with, um, COBOL, the reason I enjoy this COBOL programming course as much as I do is it's mission critical, right? The most important applications running the day and the things we're reliant on for things we do every single day, it's probably being driven by COBOL and it's definitely being driven on a mainframe. Um, so just to echo really Paul's point on the criticality of the, the COBOL language, um, it's necessary. And if, if we can uh, do something to help encourage folks to learn COBOL and bring more uh, folks to the mainframe platform as well, I think that's all going to benefit us and uh, the larger community in, in the long term. And coming full circle, Sadarshana brought something up. There was a, a professor, his first name was Tack, that helped us. And I really enjoyed working with Tack. Brilliant teacher. I would have loved to have had him as a teacher. But Tack, as Sadarshana said, Tack made the comment once he started studying COBOL. And he, he's a computer science guy. He actually made the statement that um, so COBOL is not a fashion statement. And that was a great phrase. These languages aren't fashion statements. They're fit for purpose. And to do things right, you know, you pick the, you pick the correct language for the correct situation. And uh, so I thought that was an excellent comment that Sudarshan made early about what Tack had said. Um, so we do have a question. Do we learn new features of COBOL like handling JSON input? in the course, I guess that's the question. Yeah, I can start with that. So um, we didn't do a special section on it. However, that did come up. And it turns out that um, IBM Z Enterprise COBOL has a generate JSON. It's got these other functions that are specifically for handling JSON, not only JSON input, but um, writing JSON. So it can generate JSON and write it. So if you, if you look into the, the latest and greatest features of the IBM Z Enterprise COBOL, you'll actually see uh, functions uh, specifically for JSON to make JSON handling easy within COBOL. So hopefully that answers that. So when you, when you say, do we learn new features? Um, I don't think we have a chapter on that yet where we go into detail about it because we want to st start with the basics first. So to answer your direct question, do we learn new features of COBOL like handling JSON? You learn some new features in the intrinsic functions, but I don't believe at this time we had anything that really does JSON, but I believe some people went out there and uh, wrote some stuff that works in JSON. I don't know if they made it public or not. So we don't teach, we do, while we do teach new features, uh, I don't think we have anything specifically for handling JSON, but in the book, I'm pretty sure I make reference to it. Mm -hmm. I'll just look up the, the, and Mike would know better than me. He probably mm -hmm. looks at the book more than me. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, there, there's a reference to those exact functions with reading JSON and COBOL in the intrinsic functions chapter. Yep. Yeah, thank you, Mike. But I don't know if we went into details of showing examples, but it's pretty easy to find examples just doing a just doing an internet search. Yeah, and I, I just... That got me thinking was, we could also put some sort of challenge in. Um, there's one of the challenges you get some JSON format, but I think you convert it to a CSV file before you upload it to the mainframe and then you read it from the CSV file. We could change that to read directly from the JSON output or, or if, if I don't know who asked that question, but if, if you were interested, you could check out one of those challenges which starts from uh, JSON data and perhaps you know, offer, offer a contribution as well. And, and we would gladly accept it. But uh, yeah, I don't think we have anything um, specific as far as a chapter on that particular use case and that particular uh, intrinsic function. Yeah, I was just gonna add that Mike saying, you know, this is a great opportunity for folks to come and um, contribute to this course and to the community. Um, looks like this might be a good addition to our advanced topic. Um, sounds like that to me. So, yep, yeah, please feel free to come and be part of the community and the repository and um, contribute. We'd love that. 
and I will make one statement about um, the the lab system. And uh, just let you know, this is all about learning. And so some people in handling JSON, it's not a product, it's not meant to be a production system. So I wanted to caution people about saying, oh, I'm going to upload uh, 80 gigabyte of data. You know, no, it's a test environment, development environment. Please keep your data sources small. I would appreciate it. <laughs> good, good point, Paul. Excellent I, point, I I... Paul. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, any other questions about the course, about how to access it, about COBOL? We haven't. We have SMEs here, so you know, feel. Don't be shy. Okay. I don't see any other questions um, on that or the Q and A. Um, Paul or Mike, any other? Um, additional points around COBOL or the open mainframe project and how to access, or we can wrap this up if not. Nothing, nothing for me. Thank you all again for joining. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Mike, for being here with us. And thank you so much, Chris and open mainframe project for, you know, hosting this project. It is, it has been an amazing year for COBOL thanks to open mainframe project and this course that has landed there. The community has greatly benefited. It's been, um, it's been really heartwarming to see all the engagement when we meet for our TSC calls, we're often looking at issues and PRs and you know which ones we can quickly merge and put out a new PDF. So thank you for keeping us, um, you know, giving us that excitement when we meet every once in a week. So keep that continued engagement um, going. We really look forward to that. Um, happy holidays, everybody. Yeah, and we'll see you all in the new year. Great, thank you so much. This is so informative and I think there was some great content in here. So thank you to the COBOL training team for all the hard work you're doing, all the, the amazing job you're doing. And I just wanna thank everybody for attending from the Open Mainframe Project. And don't forget to join us next month when we talk about Zoe. All right, everybody have a great day. Thank you very much. <laughs>